Okay, so uh, <clears throat> today we'll pay homage to uh, this very important uh, North American um, uh, architect from the 19th century, who unfortunately died young, uh, Henri Opson Richardson. So Henri Hobson Richardson was born in September 1838, but he died on April 27th, 1886 was a proeminent American architect, best known for his work in a style that became known as Richardsonian Romanesque. Along with Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright, Richardson is one of the recognized trinity of American architecture. A great honor, I would say. I mean, you know, Louis Sullivan, Frank Lloyd Wright, and H.H. Uh, Richardson, the recognized Trinity of American architecture. Of course, the word Trinity is uh, alluding to the religious uh, celestial Trinity in, in Christianity. Here was the man, uh, and uh, he suffered of an, of an illness, uh, and uh, that's why he died uh, rather young. I think he studied at Harvard, and um, you see, he he was ill, he had an illness, but even this picture I think is, uh, is magnificent in the sense that here he was an unusual man, even the way he dressed. And uh, uh, by the way, anyway, I should not uh, talk about this now because I record here is another picture with H.H. H. Richardson, uh, a formidable architect. And you'll see until 47 when he died, 47, 48, uh, he built so much, you would be very surprised. Uh, so, H.H. H. Richardson, H.H. H. Richardson, H.H. H. Richardson. And again, uh, this picture that uh, I began with. Okay, so we begin with this Trinity Church, which is even on the cover of, um, the second volume dedicated to modern architecture by um, Francesco Dalco and uh, Manfredo Tafuri, uh, two volumes dedicated to modern architecture. And on the cover of one of them is the Trinity Church um, by, uh, by Richardson. Uh, indeed, the most acclaimed early work. This is the church. Um, now, of course, for someone who was raised uh, within the paradigm of modernity, as illustrated here in the back, this might appear, you know, passeistic and uh, even uninteresting. But there are many innovations here. is um, is a building which is uh, announcing, in a way, the iconoclasm of, of modernity. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll go more in detail about this work later. <clears throat> now, the Thomas Crane, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, uh, public library in Quincy, Massachusetts, with Japanese-inspired eyelid dormers in the roof on each side of the entrance. Uh, if you see this building, you, you could afterwards recognize very easily buildings by H.H. H. Richardson. He was inspired by the Romanesque architecture, you know, the, the, the architecture in Europe, which preceded the Gothic. And um, you, you will see actually um, uh, in most of his works, this influence being um, uh, paramount. The old colony station in Northeast, uh, this is a, a, a train station. Um, detail from old colony railroad station showing a dragon carved in the beam of a glazed Syrian arch. Uh, again, we are dealing with an architect who built in the second half of the 19th century. So, you know, the, these kind of details today uh, are difficult to imagine. Although during postmodernism, uh, probably it wasn't so difficult. Although built in traditional fashion of stone without steel frame, Richardson well integrated Marshall Field wholesale store in Chicago 
was very influential in the development of modern approaches to building facades. A huge building, as you can see, you know, I'm sure you, are, you were surprised, you know, after the buildings we saw, he built, uh, he built many buildings and um, this building shows, uh, the, you know, the, the power of his, um, of his uh, architecture. Uh, Howard like a Taylor Library building in New Orleans. Well, most architects in the 19th century and particularly in Great Britain, but not only in Great Britain, were influenced by the Gothic, not by the Romanesque. In, in this sense, uh, uh, Richardson is rather unique. Of course, he lived and worked in the United States, but even in the United States, the Romanesque was not so popular. Uh, a house in Chicago, uh, but he's, sorry, this was a mistake. Uh, it's, uh, the year was, was, uh, was wrongly written. Anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a house, uh, you know, uh, part of, the, of the, the urban fabric uh, a mansion, a uh, postcard. Uh, this one actually was built in England based on the, um, I don't know if a whole project or some sketches by Richardson, but I like it very much. Unfortunately, it was destroyed. Um, and uh, it, it was built for a professor. You see his name there. A good building. I, I really regret this building is not still standing. Uh, Cheney building uh, in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, some of these buildings do not exist any longer. Grace Episcopal Church. This is just um, an ad memoir of, of his works, like one image or two, and then we'll go in detail with some particular buildings. Uh, this is a view from the top, not very clear perhaps. Here you see it better. And it's rather unusual the way he employed stones, you know, uh, in a kind of a naive, primitive way. Um, but it, it's still interesting. Uh, you, you know, the formally trained architect, but then he was a formally trained architect himself. It's just that he, uh, he was rather rebellious, I would say, but I like this. I like very much the, the, the tectonics of his architecture, you know, because it's, 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 it's real. It's made with stones in this case. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, pleasant, not just to the eye, but also to, to the touch, I imagine. Innovations by, uh, by um, Richardson. Uh, he went with the, with the stones all the way up on the spire, which is not very common. I guess some work was done here. Uh, this is a house from 1868. Again, part of the part of the um, of the city is not. He also built in you know in nature or outside of the city. But here there were restrictions, I guess you know uh, the vicinities and so on. Um, a more urban house, a more uh, in a way uh, less free house, but. But you have to understand within the city, uh, like with like inside a bus or inside a, a subway, you cannot extend your arms too much. I, I mean, you have to conform to the, you know, to the characteristics of the place. But still, uh, it's it's not a bad building. And uh, again, we are talking about mid nineteenth century. His own house from 1868 in Staten Island, uh, refurbished, of course. Strangely, or maybe not so strangely, in his own house, he um, uses a different architectural language. In no other building by him, he used this. Now, I don't know, maybe it was modified in time. 
in recent times. That is a possibility too, but, but I doubt it because considering the fame of the architect, I imagine you know, uh, the new owner was not allowed to do whatever he or she wanted with the building. It's possible that the building was conceived differently from his uh, other, other works, other buildings. His own house, but not, uh, not, it's not an outrageous statement. If you compare, for example, the, 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 you know, the deconstructivist intervention of uh, Frank Gehry in his own kitchen, in his own home, uh, with, uh, with this, in the case of Frank Gehry, Frank Gehry expressed himself as freely as he was ca capable of in his own house. In the case of H.H. H. Richardson, uh, you see him more reticent uh, than uh, in, 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 in many of his other works. H.H. H. Richardson. Now, uh, this is a monument from 1868. Um, Nothing big exceptional here, I would say. Yeah, it's a it's it's a gravestone. Uh, what can we say? But he built another one, which is very intriguing and uh, impressive, I would say. And you are going to see it. the William Dorsheimer House in Buffalo, 1868. I guess in this kind of houses, I mean, this is not so different in a way from his own house. Uh, it's a different. Uh, it's a different uh, spirit than his public buildings. There is a certain fragility almost uh, and modesty. Well, it's still a rather big building for a, you know, for a one family house, but uh, it's not massive. It's not fortress like, like most of his architecture actually is, particularly the, the public buildings. Uh, a church, this is another church in, in Boston, um, I don't know if I have better pictures with it. Yeah, I have uh, this one here. Uh, you see actually in the back, uh, the tower by uh, IMP uh, that I showed yesterday. And uh, this is the, the, the flash, the, the clock tower, or I don't know how to call it of the, of the church by H.H. H. Richardson. Stone, heavy, massive. Uh, yes, it's the house of God, but uh, it's still a little bit, of, in a way, perhaps is appropriate. So for public buildings, for churches, he used, you know, uh, eternal uh, you know, characteristics, so to speak, the stone and uh, the solidity of the walls evoke you know, a desire to last. While he's in domestic architecture, although I will end this presentation with a house, which is um, a little bit different, is less fragile than, than some other houses that we already saw. Anyway, at that time, of course, uh, sculptors and uh, painters were used to, to, to adorn the building something we don't even think about these days. This is very alarming. Not only that we don't do it, but we don't even think about doing it. And the poor painters and sculptors have very difficult lives because they even have a hard time to make a living. Some of them do things that have nothing to do with art in order to survive. When in fact, the architect could employ, could associate himself or herself with a painter, with a sculptor, and uh, together build something that uh, would uh, please uh, Walter Gropius, the, the author of the Bauhaus Manifesto. Why is it that we, we neglect, we neglect the, the, the dialogue between the arts? The New York State Asylum in Buffalo, 1869. Now look at this. I don't know why it is called an asylum. Uh, I think it's a governmental building now or it looks like, but isn't it impressive? I mean, this building, if these building, buildings, these buildings were built in Europe, they would have been the pride of any city, you know, from Paris to Amsterdam to London, they, 
and and these are uh, you know uh, built in Buffalo, New York, upstate New York. Uh, the, of course, this is a uh, I don't know what it is a uh, collage and a, a projected uh, um, you know contemporary intervention. Of course, he didn't do this this part, but he did uh, he did this and. Uh, <laughs> You know, for someone who died at 47 uh, to, to build so many buildings, and uh, we have to acknowledge these are not, uh, you know, any buildings. The, in fact, most architects, if they build just this, they would feel uh, accomplished. Um, anyway, the joggers pass by uh, happily. A fine building, we have to, we have to say it. Yes, it's historically, uh, you know, informed. But you know, it was built at that time, and but it's built with conviction and with skill. Now it was not a, a project; it's uh, clearly a, a new entrance into the building. It's okay, I guess. Here is also perhaps a, a, you know a, a more recent um, addition or intervention. H. H. Richardson in Buffalo, New York. Um, Yeah, in Buffalo, New York, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright had a great building, Larkin, Larkin building, which was demolished. And demolished for what? In order to make room for a parking lot. It's unbelievable. Larkin building was one of the best buildings by Frank Lloyd Wright. And it was erased, demolished with a bulldozer to make a parking lot. I actually launched a competition, an international competition, to imagine another Larkin building. I mean, to 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 resuscitate in a way creatively, at least the memory of the tower. And I received some interesting projects. You can see them on ecarch.us. It's also in Buffalo. Um, yeah. So H. H. Richardson, H. H. Richardson. A courthouse in the Springfield, Massachusetts, 1871. Um, seen from the air, stone, stone again. Now maybe these kind of buildings uh, do not move us a lot these days because we are distanced from what we call historicism and even history. A North Congregational Church, also in, in Springfield, Massachusetts, 1871. But no one would contest, you know, the the you know the the lofty aspirations of, of, of this church. If no one told you what it is, it, it it would be obvious it is a church, and it's built well. That's how it looks like now. You look at the cars. These are, you know, uh, recent cars. Not bad. A good church. A good building for a church by H.H. Uh, Richardson. Some some might think that Sullivan and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright who are actually better known were more innovative, but um, no one can dismiss the, you know, the prolificity and the variety of works left behind by um, H.H. Uh, Richardson. Plus, let us not forget, while Frank Lloyd Wright lived to, to be over 90, this man died at almost half the age of Frank Lloyd Wright. So you can imagine if he lived like, uh, like Frank Lloyd Wright for 90 something years, and he already created so much, you can imagine what H.H. H. Richardson would have done.
The Trinity Church, we already saw a picture of it in Boston, the National Historic Landmark Trinity Church, 1872. So 150 years ago, this building was built in Boston. It's not bad. It has a level of heterogeneity, it's true, uh, but uh, it is an interesting building. I didn't analyze it carefully, but maybe I should. And even the interior is, I think, uh, rather interesting. You know, it's, um, I, I actually find it very creative. And, you know, the, the, the usage of color and the, the, you know, the ornamental work. You don't see usually in churches uh, or cathedrals too much redness, redness and blue. But uh, here, there is plenty. So, yeah, it's interesting. And, but even forget the color, it, you know, the, the structure, the space is, 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 a, is, a, is, an, is a creative building. And no wonder, again, that Manfredo Tafuri and Francesco Del Co uh, placed, um, I imagine they, they chose the picture for the cover of that uh, important book on the history of modern architecture. But look at the, look at the vaults, look at the ceiling. It's, it has complexity, it has, uh, it has culturalness as well. It even made it on a stamp. This is the, the ultimate uh, homage, right? If you, if you can live so, uh, you know, creatively to finally arrive at, on a stamp, you or your works, then uh, it means you didn't live for nothing. It's kind of strange and even uh, almost uh, humorous, no? That we, we struggle so much on this earth. And at best, at best, if you are chosen, so to speak, you leave behind one of the most fragile, um, you know, things that humankind invented, a stamp. Yeah, so behind the uh, IMP is building uh, and uh, in the front, H.H. H. Richardson. Which one is richer? Which one is more interesting? Well, I think modernity had its successes, but also had its failures. Because there is more richness here on a, you know, almost a square meter than it is here in the whole building, architecturally speaking. It looks good uh, with that background uh, behind. It is a good building. Uh, bravo, H.H. H. Richardson. Uh, a house, Newport, Rhode, Rhode Island. Proud uh, chimneys, as you can see. This is uh, an older picture, of course. Uh, more uh, uh, telluric. I wouldn't mind living in such a house, of course. And I think all modernists, including Le Corbusier, would have loved to live in such a house. Yeah, I'm absolutely sure. Also, don't you think it is, uh, you know, somehow telling that Tadao Ando, who only builds in concrete, he actually lives in a wooden house, totally wooden house that belonged to his parents and was, uh, you know, now he lives in it. So he doesn't live in a concrete house. He lives in a wooden house. This was a good building. It still is. Another building in Boston, Hayden Building. Uh, you know, uh, maybe a less uh, enticing building, but also because of its uh, urban, uh, again, or urban uh, conditions, which had to be respected, I guess. 
But if I compare it with the only building that, um, well, that house that Raphael built in, the, in, 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 in Rome, um, I don't think this building uh, is uh, inferior to that building. Now, it's true that building was built during the Renaissance and this one in the 19th century. But, you know, even though it's not the, one of the masterpieces of H.H. Uh, H. Richardson, it's not bad, I think. Uh, what is this? The Cheney building. Uh, you know, look at this. Uh, compare it with this building on the left and this building on the right, a newer building. This one still stands out for, uh, you know, uh, tectonic articulation, complexity, solidity. It's a good building. We eliminated the ornament. We are so afraid of ornament that, uh, you know, we don't even use the word, do we? The New York State Capitol in Albany, look at this. When did this man build all these buildings? I think he built several buildings and, you know, large commissions like this one per year. I mean, he didn't have more than 20 years of professional activity because he died at 47. He was obviously uh, acknowledged uh, and that's why he received such, uh, such commissions. Uh, this is the, the most important uh, governmental building in, in Albany. And, and look at this. Well, that is until uh, Wallace Harrison built the new buildings. But uh, I, 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 I still think this is a building one cannot ignore from uh, Albany or not. By the way, Albany is the, the administrative, the political uh, uh, capital of um, uh, uh, the state of New York. It's not New York City, it, it's Albany. In as much as, uh, you know, the, the, the capital of, uh, of the United States is not uh, one of the biggest cities like um, Los Angeles or uh, New York, but, or Chicago, but uh, Washington. Good, good work. Now, what is this? A memorial. This one, I, I, uh, I, uh, I don't know what happened. I don't have pictures with this one. Well, there is another memorial. Maybe it's not this one a little bit later. Uh, a library. Now we arrive at the paradigmatic H.H. H. Richardson. And yes, they are a little bit uh, similar. He built several uh, libraries. And the city hall, uh, in the case of H. H. Richardson, looks kind of similar to the build to the libraries he built, but it's not a bad building. Again, you know, I, I would gladly open a book in this library, very gladly. Uh, some old pictures. I mean, an old picture. It has dignity. It has force. It has. Um, it has. Uh, you know. Uh, yeah, dignity, I would say. Another library, a Bill Several. They, they look kind of alike. He had a, you know, a, a way of building libraries and he didn't uh, experiment unnecessarily. And they still stand out, you know, they, they, they still stand out and not in terms of, uh, you know, physicality, but in terms of, uh, you know, architectural significance. So you recognize a building by H.H. H. Richardson if you know a little bit about Romanesque architecture, because yes, he was influenced by the Romanesque, and that's why his architecture is called Richardsonian Romanesque. Cambridge, 1878, a large building again in Cambridge.
Now, is this an owl? Probably, uh, which uh, you know symbolizes uh, wisdom. Libraries do use um, this symbol in Chicago. Uh, Thomas Peavy, uh, the former dean of Yale University, built a library where you see the, the owl uh, everywhere. Uh, this is a memorial uh, it's called memorial, but it's a town hall. It's a city hall, a town hall. It's not a big difference between a library and a city hall in terms of architecture. Maybe this could be commented upon in less auspicious terms, but it's still a good building. It's not a building that one would be ashamed of, far from it. And it is heroic. It's, it's uh, you know, yes, the romanticism of H.H. Uh, Richardson is a reality. We have flat roofs these days. We don't. Uh, we are not moved by uh, you, know, you know sloping roofs like this, especially for public buildings. Nor are we moved by this kind of walls or textures. We love whiteness and uh, you know uh, smooth surfaces. That's it. Uh, Zaha Hadid. Uh, um, wrote or said that uh, she was searching for a raw architecture, earthy architecture, uh, vital architecture. But she never arrived and I don't think she actually, uh, I mean, I didn't see signs that she was actually seriously uh, moving towards a raw architecture. This is, it's raw and uh, earthy because of the materials that were used, and it's also vital. It's 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 a, a tectonically is a, a building that uh, would not have easily accepted, you know, the the white, uh, you know, sleek uh, fluidities of Zaha Hadid and uh, other architects work in the same way. And look here, you know, uh, again, uh, small so-called details which are ornamental. Why not? Why not? We can even invent, uh, create uh, abstract ornaments. You know, we could invite uh, an abstract artist, an abstract sculptor, an abstract painter, and uh, collaborate with them. And, uh, you know, certain parts of the building allow them to contribute. That would be nice, I think. The rectory for Trinity Church, this was, um, it's also in Boston but I don't know, um, yeah. Uh, so this is not the church itself, but a, a building that is associated with the church. You see just this arch is not left. That's why, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Peter Zumtor, we talked about you yesterday, but the, that entrance in the chapel, if we compare that poor, poor, you know, little entrance, those steps, you know, left, uh, left uh, totally undesigned and done without sensitivity, you know, and here is, I mean, you cannot compare. I mean, I understand that we are, we don't have faith any longer and it's possible that Mr. Zumtor doesn't either, but if you decide to build a chapel, build it properly. Uh, here we see just in this arch, you know, how embroidered is, you know, the, 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 the edges of, of the arch. It shows care. Uh, we are talking about care. Care, you care for the building. You care for the entrance into the building. You care for that moment when you cross the threshold between the outside and the inside. This monument is uh, interesting and uh, I, I, I alluded to it. It's, it's uh, you know, I, it's primal, it's archaic. It's, uh, I like it. It, it doesn't have, uh, you know, a very big dimensions, but it, it does show that H.H. H. Richardson was a, a courageous man, you know, uh, this, Okay, the, the previous monument we saw wasn't uh, really exceptional, but this one, I think it is. I like it. It's, it's, um, 
Uh, well, okay, it's not like the step pyramid of uh, uh, King Zoser's architect that is Imhotep, but maybe in terms of spirit is not much less. Uh, also, it's dedicated to a, to a mortal, to a, you know, uh, not to a pharaoh. And it was built in the 19th century, but I like it very much. <laughs> the lodge, <clears throat> 1880. Stone, I don't know where this man uh, got all, uh, or where, where did he get all his, uh, all, all this stone from? You know, he probably <laughs> left uh, all the country without stones. And he, you know, he, he went with the stones all the way to the ceiling, to the, to the roof. Interesting man. Um, he was obviously an architect. He loved architecture. He lived for architecture. He loved stones. Um, now it's also true. He was not uh, physically the most fragile man in the world. So, you know, maybe he saw some kind of a companionship between him and the stones. Um, but again, H. 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 Richardson does deserve to be one of the three uh, men who composed the North American Trinity of architecture. A bridge from 1880, he, he also found time to, to design a bridge, a bridge you can trust. Uh, a gatehouse, 1880. Well, this one maybe is not so impressive. Uh, this public library in Quincy, uh, Massachusetts from 1880, National Historic Landmark. Uh, but um, I don't know, I think I, you saw it before, but I don't know why I have this text here because I, I have no pictures. The Old Colony Railroad Station, 1881, also in Massachusetts, he designed several railroad stations. I don't know if the United States still, uh, still builds uh, railroad stations because the United States at this point is not interested in the train. The train are very obsolete and very slow, believe it or not. But then at the end of the 19th century, um, you know, it was a prestigious uh, activity in Beaver to unite the distant parts of the country by train. So the train stations were important and many were built and some good architects contributed to, to building, uh, uh, you know, uh, railroad stations. We saw this one. I once took the train from New York City to Denver, Colorado, 48 hours. 48 hours, two days, I mean, two full days with a stop in Chicago, extremely slow, because only the poorest people in the country use the train. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the car manufacturers want to sell their cars, so they don't, they sabotage, I, I imagine, the public transportation. The public transportation in the United States is deficient. In the big cities, yes, the subway works, the buses work, but even the buses are not very sophisticated. Uh, and the trains certainly are not. Another library, 1883. We know by now how a library by H.H. Uh, Richardson looks like. And this could have been also something else, either a city hall and almost a church. No. But it's a library. But maybe you know the relationship between the church and the library shouldn't be so, uh, you know, uh, frail, because at one point, you know, in the Middle Ages and maybe even before, the church was also a place of learning. There was a school near the church, and uh, you know there was a connection between the act of learning and the the act of worshiping, uh, although. Of course, the Bible said that, you know, the curiosity that uh, sent Adam and Eve outside of uh, paradise was um, fatal to them exactly because, uh, you know, there was a tension between faith and, uh, and knowledge. 
uh, I'm not sure Adam and Eve learned too much by uh, you know taking a bite bite from the apple. But uh, anyway. So look at this interior. I almost said, wow, you know, the, it's a library, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think uh, that there are many libraries in the world that wouldn't like to have such a central space as this one does. Another good building by H.H. Uh, Richardson, uh, Episcopal Church, Pittsburgh, 1883. I like it in its simplicity. You know, it's. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I hope I have other pictures. Well, not excellent pictures, but I'm sorry. I wish they were larger. I like this building. You know, it, it makes me think a little bit of some. Uh, uh, you know, austere architecture in uh, in Denmark, uh, or in general in some Scandinavian countries. But the interior again is rich and complex and uh, look at that uh, the wooden structure of the ceiling. It's not bad. Yes, the exterior is a little bit, uh, you know, self-explanatory, so to speak. But I still think the building is, is not bad. Uh, what is this? This is a I think it's a courthouse here. You'd be very surprised. Because these are, I mean, look at these buildings. You know, again, these are civic buildings that would, 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 would give pride to many cities in the world. I mean, what city in the world wouldn't like to have such a building? And this, this is in Pittsburgh, the city of uh, Andy Warhol, who also has a room uh, dedicated to money. If you can imagine the house of an artist and something that Andy Warhol was even uh, almost a, a Christ-like figure, but inside his, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, a memorial house, his Andy Warhol museum, there is a room dedicated entirely to money. Uh, this man also, you know, he collected, um, he collected uh, batteries, and um, he wouldn't. Uh, Anyway, he became immensely rich, but I find it in very bad taste, actually, or maybe I have a very romantic uh, vision about what an artist is, you know, because I think, I think artists are kind of like uh, the stranger in that beautiful poem by the, um, Charles Baudelaire, where the poet is asked, do you love gold, meaning money? And uh, Baudelaire uh, says, the poet says, I hate it in as much as you hate God. I guess uh, I can, I guess um, Andy Warhol didn't hate it. No, he didn't. Anyway, back to H. H. Richardson, another important civic building. Uh, look at this. You know, it's you say I, we are in Europe here. Uh, you know, with uh, with buildings coming down to us in the present because we see the cars from uh, you know centuries ago no it is in the united states and uh, it is uh, powerful architecture the interior is uh, monumental and impressive marriage ceremonies take place here and i think you are going to see a picture yes here it is you know maybe maybe you know the schools of architecture should uh, teach the students, the future architects, how to make buildings in such a way that marriage ceremonies would gladly take place inside their buildings. You know, this, this, this should be like a, a course, how to make a building so appealing, so interesting, so uh, dignified and inspiring that uh, young, uh, you know, men and women would choose to get married within the building. I mean, look at this building here, and this one here, and, and this one. And uh, are these a progress? I love modernity, but um, I'm not sure this is progress compared to this.
Pittsburgh. H. H. Richardson, probably at a very early hour because there is no one on the streets, on the sidewalks, and even and we see only one car. Robert Treat Paint House. Uh, I hope I have better pictures. Sorry about this. But even in this picture, rather unclear, you can see, you know, uh, a lot going on here. You know, the stair is contributing to the to the first floor, and uh, you see insinuations of the second floor from the first floor, and I, I think it's good. All covered in wood, of course. We cannot uh, uh, manage uh, these days any longer to cut down trees like this, but at that time, he should be forgiven. Stone again, and I don't know, I guess a fire took place there or something happened to it. And now that I look at it, I, I find it a little bit excessive to, to go uh, with a stone even to the, you know, the, to the chimneys and uh, the, but, okay, another railroad station, and uh, it is clearly so, it doesn't need the, my explanation, but it's a good building, it's a good building, and I would gladly take the slow train here, from here, although I would even more gladly take a high-speed train, uh, high-speed uh, high, high Japanese or Chinese train from this station, yes. Emmanuel Baptist Church, Newton, Massachusetts, another church. Again, can you believe it that this young man, actually, young man, you know, he was in his 30s that he built all these buildings. He died at 47. It's amazing. And even more amazing is that he's an architect uh, nobody talks about in many schools of architecture. Um, another library as if we didn't yet see uh, quite a number of them. Uh, similar, yes, to the previous ones, but doing its job. And I think not in a you know, demeaning way. Look at the detail here. You know, we don't do this sort of thing. Of course, of course, we, we reduced architecture to so much that uh, I mean, look at this detail here, you know, somebody drew it, designed it, and someone built it. A different world. And look at the embroidered facade. Look at this. I mean, really, you know, when I, if I compare just this fragment of this building by H.H. H. Richardson with a with the, the ornamental jokes of Olgiati on a building he built in, in, in Switzerland, I, I just cannot compare them. I really, I cannot compare them. It's impossible. Here there is seriousness and sensitivity, uh, knowledge also, discretion. <laughs> you cannot compare. It's impossible to compare. And I just mentioned another god of our um, time at least for some people. I know I, I would contemplate this for, uh, for a longer time and uh, be okay, maybe it's not the most uh, jolly uh, figure to contemplate, but I would, my imagination would work, you know? What did Richardson want to say with this, you know? Of course, he was influenced by uh, Europe, by, uh, you know, gargoyles and, uh, but it's, I don't know. I think this is an art which should be again uh, reconsidered. And uh, but for this, you need culture. You need uh, you need uh, you know you need knowledge. You know knowledge. You, you cannot just uh, you know uh, throw uh, some some kind of a narrative on a wall, or modern wall. Uh, you know without some kind of knowledge of mythology of symbolism of uh, you know. Uh, but this is not what schools of architecture do these days. No one talks about mythology. No one. Uh, Bagley Memorial Fountain in Detroit. A fountain. Uh, refurbished. In, for my taste, too white, too unaffected by the elements. 
but it was cleaned up, obviously, you know, from 1885, you know, 135, uh, 37 years ago, it should have had a patina, but then the French also cleaned up the Western facade of Notre Dame in Paris. I understand you, you want to, you know, to, to correct the passage of time, but sometimes the correction goes too far. I, it's an art, I think. I, I think the patina to an extent should be kept. If it's too clean, I don't know, it, it becomes septic. I, I like it more here. Where you could say I, I have a deviant uh, mentality, which is possible, but I like it more here than here. I'm suspicious of things which are too shiny and clean and, you know, so-called perfect. Okay, Glessner House, Chicago. We are approaching the end of the presentation. National Historic Landmark. No, no, I think I, 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 I was a little bit uh, uh, in a hurry. Uh, I thought a different building will show up. Another, well, huge building, fortress like H. H. Richardson, no mistake about it. It's a national landmark, uh, but I think other buildings by him are greater than this one, but I think this one, uh, because of its size and, you know, maybe location also is uh, prestigious or who knows who lives there or what is happening there. Although this part of the building is, is rather impressive. I don't like very much this uh, architecture in the courtyard. Another, another train station, a larger Union passenger station, New London, Connecticut. I like more the, the smaller ones, but... Uh, interesting fountain though, the found fountain sculpture, he didn't do it, of course. Uh, this is the, we already saw a picture of it, is this building built in England based on his design or his drawings. And I will read a little bit about it. I don't know why it is Kululu Lound. It was the Romanesque revival style house and studio of German born British artist Hubert von Herkomer in Melbourne Road, Bershire, Hertfordshire. My God, so many informations. It was designed in uh, 1886 and inhabited in 1894, <laughs> kind of strange, designed in, ah, yes, no, no, it's not strange. I thought it was uh, inhabited before it was designed, sorry, 1894. It was demolished in 1939. The exterior design was developed from a sketch by the American architect, Henry Hobson Richardson, and was the only example of his work in Europe. I like it in the postcard, and I think I would have liked it even more if the building was not demolished. Uh, there is a fragment that still uh, persists, but it's sad. This was demolished. Very, very sad. Uh, a good building. And this is what remained of it. But uh, I love it even as a fragment like this. Actually, I would gladly live in this fragment of uh, the only building by H. H. Richardson, or designed by him in Europe. Another house, Newton, Massachusetts, big with a courtyard, with a patio, you know, kind of like the patio by uh, um, <laughs> Peter Sumtor uh, for the Serpentine Pavilion. Uh, anyway. Impressive uh, the verticality of the trees and impressive the horizontality of the, of the house uh, interrupted by the triangles of the sloping roofs. I like this building and I like this picture of this building. Not bad. Okay, so um, he died on the, on the 27th of April. And now we go to the second presentation today, a shorter presentation, not about an architect, but about a building, but by the way of the birthday of, of, the, of the one, this great building was built for. And that is um, 
we are, we'll talk about the Tash Mahal. Nothing else but the Tash Mahal. So it was built by Shah Yahan in memory of his wife, Mumtaz Mahal. Uh, the Taj Mahal was commissioned by Shah Yahan in 1631, so almost 400 years ago, to be built in the memory of his wife, Mumtaz Mahal, who died on the 17th of June that year, giving birth to the 14th child. Construction started in 1632 and the mausoleum was completed in 1643, so 11 years it took uh to to be built while the surrounding buildings and garden were finished five years later the imperial court documenting shah yahan's grief after the death of mumtaz mahal illustrates the love story held as the inspiration for the Taj mahal and of course the name of the building uh, is is her name mahal Everybody knows uh, this building from pictures. Some visited it, I didn't, but it is a splendid building. And uh, somehow it's even more splendid because it was built as a, as a, as a great proof of love. And love is, is the most important thing on this earth. Maybe I, I said the banality, but maybe this banality should be uh, repeated including in the years of Vladimir Putin. Who is killing these very days out of hatred, of course. Uh, we are contemplating beauty at a time when airplanes and bombs are falling on Ukraine. Here they are, the couple. The Taj Mahal was built for, for her on the right. I love these miniatures, these Indian uh, miniatures. You know. uh, love. Unfortunately, uh, you maybe noticed in English, the word eros, read from right to left, becomes sore. And maybe the French are right, because it is said that the French know a lot about love. And in, in French, there is this saying, uh, il n'y a pas d'amour heureux, there is no happy love. I don't know, uh, there might be some exceptions. This was not happy either because she died, but um, I'm sure when she lived, there was love between them. Without this love, the Taj Mahal would not have existed. So here is the building. Uh, what can we say? At that time, people still employed ornament. And I think uh, if you remove the ornament from the Taj Mahal, you get a poorer building. I mean, the ornament that animated the, the miniatures, the, the graphic miniatures that we looked at are you know, similar to the, to the, to the ornaments that uh, animate the building. It's the spring of the soul. This is what the, the ornament is. If it's well done, because yes, it could be done also in less convincing ways. But again, you know, the building is, uh, is uh, bringing a, a sensitivity. Uh, no, uh, the ornament is bringing a sensitivity to the building, which without it would have been more uh, morose and and uh, we don't want that do we although again how many architects employ although some uh, contemporary architects do make steps in the direction of bringing back ornament uh, some uh, in interesting ways um yeah 
the Taj Mahal. It's bulbous architecture. It's also, it's, I mean, structurally is, is a, you know, impeccable building, but so is in its uh, uh, decorative elements. And here you can read, uh, you know, uh, various informations about this building. Uh, you see the at random, you see calligraphy on large, you see, dado, decorated frames with pietra dura. Um, Again, we see the several times the word decorative, tall decorative spire, ornamental terminating part, lotus decoration. A different mentality, a different mentality, a different time, a, diff a different kind of construction, and maybe even a different type, a kind of love. Although I think love, if it's genuine, remains the same. I think love uh, 5,000 years ago and 1,000 years ago and 100 years ago and one day ago is the same. The Taj Mahal exterior, um, we already saw this. Again, these, these ornaments move me because in their innocence and playfulness, in their you know, uh, delicate dance, they bring a, a welcoming and welcome, welcome femininity to the building. There are two buildings actually, because the, the, you know, the building site is wider. As you can see that this is the entrance takes place from here through here. And then uh, this is the mausoleum itself. To create such a thing, you need, uh, you need artistry. Yes, you need knowledge, of course. But you need also a different spirit, you know, a spirit of a lighter spirit, because this is this was made for beauty. This was the goal to me, you know, this was not needed, you know, functionally. This this panel here had no other purpose but beauty, to be beautiful. And so did this, the, you know, the Domus Eterna of the beloved princess. Is this inferior to the sarcophagus of the Rucellai uh, that uh, Alberti, the great uh, European architect, uh, built in Florence? No, it's not. We don't know the names of these architects. We know the name of Alberti, the first architect, as he is called. But we don't know the names of these architects, and these are not inferior to Alberti. No. Look at this, it's music. It is music, embroidered music, embroidered. Look at the interior. Now, of course, in, in Persian architecture and Islamic architecture, which is splendid, often you can see such, uh, you know, not just in the Taj Mahal, but, uh, you know, even if we saw such things in, in Europe and, uh, you know, in, in other countries, uh, um, you are still moved. I am moved. And I am moved because these builders who died, you know, without being known, their names are not known, but they left something behind them that made this building, uh, uh, you know, impossible to neglect. Now, of course, they, they work for an emperor. They work for a, you know, a, a centralized power that had the means to you know, uh, sustain this project. But somehow the spirit of the prince came through the love, the love, because, because that's what it was. It was a building born from love and uh, what else can we say? Maybe all buildings should be born from love, no? Like this couple here, embracing each other in front of the Taj Mahal.
details of the Pietra Dura work. They are beautiful. Okay, the cynic might say that they are too predictably beautiful, they are too regular and too sweet, too pastoral, if I am to use a word uh, to, that was used to describe the landscaping uh, works of um, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted. No, they are not pastoral. They are beautiful because they show a uh, light spirit. They are light in spirit. They give you hope. There is no cynicism here. Then how could it be? This is the, this is the, the building of love. Bravo to them, bravo to the prince. Bravo to the princess that she inspired such a building. Bravo to the builders, the anonymous builders. Bravo to everybody. Look at the plan. You know, the, 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 use, the usable spaces are not big. You know, in fact, you know, if you add the surface of the walls, considering their thickness, it might be actually bigger than uh, the, the, the actual rooms. And the octagon, of course, again and again. Octagons, uh, how many octagons are here? Five uh, octagons. This is the plan of the Taj Mahal. So I guess it, it had a double shell to the dome, just like um, it has, like the dome in uh, Santa Maria uh, del Fiore in Florence by Brunelleschi. This is the plan. We don't build for death any longer, do we? But but if we if we neglect death, we also neglect life because life and death are the two cups of the cosmic lepsidra or our hourglass. You know, they, they, they nourish each other. They are codependent. They are, again, if you ignore one, you ignore the other. That's what I think. We are only concerned with so-called life, life and entertainment, love, life and entertainment. And we forget that all life ends in death. And if you neglect death, in my opinion, it, 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 it comes back to you like a, like a revengeful boomerang and makes your life worthless. A great building, truly one of the great buildings of the world is the Taj Mahal. Here, it is death. But death, death gives birth to life, to the exuberance of the building. Well, the measured, uh, uh, balanced exuberance of, if there is such a thing, I know it sounds oxymoronically, a balanced exuberance or measured exuberance. It's, 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 it's a beautiful song of love in stone. And uh, I love this section. Because again, it's, it shows me that death nourishes life. That's what he does through memories. I read the, the other day, a student from, I don't know what the university school of architecture, uh, she was asked um, what, uh, who is in your radar, meaning uh, what architects are, are having an influence on your work. And she said, uh, something like, uh, I don't remember exactly the words, but something like, you know, there are many, uh, uh, I, I have the, the, the pleasure of, of, um, uh, of, of a great company of, of many dead architects. Well, I know it, it, it sounds a little bit strange, no? How could you have pleasure when you mention the word dead? But, but, but if you contemplate the works of the great architects and artists of the past, who are not any longer so-called uh, uh, with us, but they are with us through their works. So indeed, you know, uh, art is able to transgress death and it, it nourishes us. And uh, just as this here, you know, is nourishing the, the splendor of the building above. A great building, 
and a great, uh, you know, uh, proof of love. Old pages, you know, done after the building was built. Here are pe people, you know. Of course, it's it's a it's a, it's an ample enterprise even to keep the building because there are so many tourists and so on. But it's it's this interplay between what we call the past and what we call the present. And the past didn't pass, it doesn't pass, just as a true love doesn't pass, true love doesn't pass. Uh, so here it is with the with a, with a landscaping in front of it, with the large space in front of it. This is the, the known uh, Taj Mahal, but there are other buildings left, right, and here the entrance, perfectly symmetrical. Uh, and here is an, a, another rendering of the of the of the so-called master plan or, or site plan. Here it is. I like this older drawing more, actually. Very nice. This was built for eternity. This was built, you know, with a, with a feeling for uh, what is not uh, perishing, what is not, of course, everything perishes, but when you build thinking and feeling about the continuity of life, about the spiral of time, about love, you think already in, 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 uh, in, 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 you know, the language of eternity, so to speak. And uh, this is what art should do. Art, art should, never, should never forget one of the halves of art. And I said this before, again, Charles Baudelaire, the great French modern, well, modern, one of the, the earliest modernists, actually in the 19th century, Charles Baudelaire, said beautifully and correctly, art has two halves. One half talks about the eternal, the immutable, the permanent. And the other half talks about the transitory, the, the ephemeral, the circumstantial. Art has to have both, not just the eternal and not just the ephemeral. Great intuition by a great thought by Charles Baudelaire, who died kind of like at the same age, like uh, or maybe even a little younger than uh, than H.H. Uh, H. Richardson. But uh, Charles Baudelaire was a poet, so poets are the youngest who die, you know, always, and the architects live the longest, with uh, some exceptions like H.H. H. Richardson. So you see, there are a few other buildings here. The mausoleum is here, you know, per se, but there is a mosque here. There is a, um, you know, uh, another tomb here, guest house, another royal tomb here, servants' quarters. So it's a complex, uh, you know, uh, significant, uh, you know, estate. Here it is. And we see here on the right the ephemerality of, uh, you know, uh, present life, so to speak, or, you know, uh, the life as, it, as we all have in the immediacy of, uh, of our lives as lived. And then we have here an homage to eternal love. And uh, so there is a, there is a dialogue in a way between the two, you know. The, here there isn't a concern for eternity because in the struggles for daily life, you don't think of the majestic elements of, uh, you know, the future or death or eternity. But somehow these two realities need each other. Without them, this would not have been possible. 
Really, because people living here, although at that time probably the, all these buildings didn't exist, but you know, anonymous people build this beautiful monument and they should be acknowledged and uh, thanked because uh, without them, the mausoleum would not have been built. Do you see how discreet? Yes, the ornamentation is distinct when you approach the building, but from far away, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it is discreet. And that's how it should be, you know, and it's, 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 it's a very delicate ornamental work, which adds, you know, I, I call it a certain femininity to the building, which is, which is a, a good thing. And I would say a necessary thing, even for our buildings today, but we don't do it now. We will again if uh, Vladimir Putin doesn't succeed in uh, alienating uh, human life on this earth. Great picture now. And I have another one. I hope I, hope I have it in this. Uh, I, 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 I hope I have it in this presentation. It's not this one. It's not even this one. Also, this one I like very much. You know, these these believers, uh, and truly, uh, I do have to say, the Muslims, in my opinion, have a. I, I, I noticed it. In my opinion, if we compare them to the Christians, uh, and they are actually good relatives because um, you know Islam and. Um, Judaic uh, faith and the Christian faith, they all spring from uh, Abraham. Yeah, they, you know, they are in a way brothers. And, uh, but I think uh, the Muslims, look at them. I don't think many Christians would do something like this. Uh, and they do it um, without any kind of questioning or hesitation. I think it's remarkable, the unity uh, in, into faith. This is the picture which I hope will end this presentation. Not that I want to end it, but I find this picture very, very uh, uh, moving. Although it's not, the colors are not almost absent, but I think it's very poetical and uh, conducive to, uh, you know, uh, melancholia to an extent and uh, to maybe even uh, philosophizing a little bit in a poetical mode. Thank you.